Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled Visualizing Dun Juan, Seeing, Studying and Conserving the Caves, uh, edited by Dora Chin and published by the Tang Center for East Asian Art uh, in association with Princeton University Press. The Law Archive, photographs of the Mogao and Yu Lin caves made by James and Lucy Lowe in 1943 and 1944, represents an incomparably valuable resource and plays a pivotal role in understanding Dunhuang. Huang. Today, scholars and visitors can experience the caves in many ways, ranging from looking at modern photographs that convey the rich colors and details of wall paintings and sculptures, to seeing virtual caves online, studying architectural plans and models, viewing manuscripts and artwork from Dunhuang, and traveling to Dunhuang itself. Such ways of seeing Dunhuang reveal the complexities and richness of the site, but leave hidden its history over the past century. Photographs dating from the early to mid 20th century, however, provide a rare glimpse of the site's transformations. Those in the Law Archive, in particular, stand out. The Law Archive and the circumstances of its creation and preservation are remarkable. An assemblage of around 3,000 photographs and related materials, including notebooks of contact sheet prints, the archive astounds with the quality and quantity of its images. In addition to capturing artistic views of the caves, the photographs provide irreplaceable historical documentation from the mid-1940s. Much of the law's accomplishments rests on the exceptional skills as a photographer that James Law brought to the project and on the organizational and curatorial skills with which Lucy Law managed the safekeeping and cataloging of the negatives and prints. Equally remarkable are the conditions under which the archive came into being. Unlike participants in many of the early 20th century photographic projects at Dunhuang, James Law did not travel to the cave site at the behest of a governmental agency, nor was he supported by well-established expeditionary teams. Rather, he embarked on this endeavor as an individual, creating his own expedition to Dunhuang and relying on personal relationships for logistical support. In spring 1943, on leave from the Central News Agency, James and Lucy Low, with their colleague Gu Timpeng, made the arduous journey to Dunhuang. When the Laws arrived at the Mogao Caves in 1943, they encountered a remote archaeological site, with uh, several resident monks but no official governing body. Despite the poor conditions, James Law embarked on his plan to systematically photograph the caves. In early 1944, the Dunhuang Art Institute was formally established under the leadership of Chang Shuhong. The Laws continued to have access to the site, however. They lived in one of the temples near the caves and even ended up receiving a stipend from the newly created institute. How James Law envisioned the project before he and Lucy arrived at the site is not known, but the magnitude of what could and needed to be documented at both Yu Lin and Mo Gao is immediately apparent even now. As Lucy Law has commented, to their eyes the caves represented a vast museum to be explored. Because their supplies were not unlimited, they needed to prioritize what to document. James Law employed a systematic approach to photographing the caves, spending the first week surveying at each site and formulating a plan to photograph what he considered the most important. One assumes that during this process of going from cave to cave, he also noted the technical requirements for producing the best negatives. A review of the photographs of the Yulin Caves, where Law had begun, reveals many gaps and suggests that he had not yet developed an overall strategy, nor was he ready to give free rein to his aesthetic taste. 
James Law had to oversee the preparation of photographic equipment and supplies for this expedition with little concrete knowledge of what he would face on the ground. He and Gut Ting Peng brought three different kinds of cameras, allowing a considerable range of technical options. A large 6x8 field camera that required loading in complete darkness sheets of film into holders that fit onto its back. A 4x5 speed Graflex, which needed similar film preparation. And a 35mm Leica, equipped with several lenses. The first two cameras relied on the use of a tripod, even if a cave had a large opening and was reasonably well lit by sunlight. The handheld Leica allowed more freedom for framing shots, but it too required a certain level of available light. The negatives from these cameras varied in size, as seen in the pages of the notebooks of contact prints that Lucy Law painstakingly compiled around 1945. James Law also clearly altered the size of negatives, sometimes uh, exposing only half of a large 6x8 piece of film and thereby doubling the number of images obtainable from one sheet. Such measures were necessary because film was very precious. In order to process the film, which had to be done regularly to assure satisfactory exposure, Law constructed a dark room near their living quarters. Often in the afternoon they developed the film exposed in the morning, and in the evening they recorded what film had been exposed to where. Despite the challenging conditions, the quality of the negatives is remarkably high as is evident uh, from a large negative made in cave uh, 217 of the north walls mural of uh, Amitabha's uh, western paradise. Studied as a whole, the Law Archive possesses unique characteristics that differentiate it from earlier photographic records. Its relatively comprehensive nature, attention to subject matter often closely related to literati painting, an aesthetic sensitivity to capturing three-dimensional space, and uh, inventive pictorial framing not found in other Dunhuang photographic projects. James Law mounted his own expedition as a photojournalist and was guided solely by his own expertise. He had no need to satisfy the scholarly, expeditionary or sinological agendas that professional explorers may have had to consider. Law recreated the caves on film through his own perspective, without the benefit or limitations of scholarly knowledge of the caves. In selecting what to photograph in a given cave, James Law was responding entirely to his own instincts regarding what was historically important and visually compelling. A comparison of the Law Archive photographs with those from the Pelio expedition demonstrates how different uh, Law's approach was from that of Nuet, who presumably took direction from Pelio. Cave 158, which dates uh, to the Middle Tang period, features a large recumbent Buddha along the entire back wall in its uh, thematic focus on the Piri Nirvana offering the photographer a potentially dramatic subject. Interestingly, Nuet photographed the cave with an emphasis on the painted throng of mourners just behind and along the upper edge of the Buddha's body. His inclusion of the main sculpture is minimal. His choice may purely reflect uh, technical limitations, Working with a large glass plate field camera mounted on a tripod and equipped with a lens of normal focal length for the time, Nuet would not have been able to frame the length of the reclining Buddha by positioning himself in the relatively shallow space directly in front of it at the cave's entrance. In contrast, James Law's equipment enabled him to realize a far more inventive recording of the cave's spatial reality and the impact of its narrative theme on the viewer. Apparently, he used all three cameras at his disposal to document the cave, 
but sometimes reduced the negative size by exposing a large 6x8 sheet twice, upper and lower halves, or by sometimes using a roll film back on the 4x5 Graflex. Like Nuet, he too was drawn to focus on the painted throng of mourning uh, disciples and bodhisattvas on the back wall immediately above the reclining Buddha's body. The layout of the cave allowed him to use the 6x8 field camera mounted on a tripod. However, his long, rectangular, highly symmetrical framing of this detail surpasses Nuet's in terms of subtle drama, because his composition includes a portion of the Buddha's ear in the left third, as if to suggest uh, the poignancy for worshippers of the Buddha's blissful entrance to Nirvana, beyond the reach of any cries. James Lowe, like uh, Nuet, could not frame the Buddha's entire body with any of these cameras from the cave's entrance, because it would have required a very wide-angle lens, which he did not have. However, by using the Leica and positioning himself uh, for one composition in the cave's uh, northeast corner and for the other at the Buddha's head uh, looking towards uh, the figure's feet, he came very close to capturing the entire statue. The Leica enabled him to achieve dramatic compositions that would not have been possible with a field camera because of space restrictions. The sequence of uh, 35 mm negatives taken in the caves reflects the manner in which a photographer using a handheld camera can experiment with compositional structures as his or her eye is engaged with the visual elements of the subject or scene. The Leica had become famous for encouraging exactly that. But in one example, Law did something truly distinctive surpassing the requirements of documentation and entering the realm of art photography. By squeezing himself into the cave's uh, northwest corner to stand at the base of the Buddha's feet, he not only conveys a better sense of the cave layout by including the doorway through which the morning sun illuminates the cave, but also communicates and heightens the effect of what a visitor would experience were he or she to have moved in close to the recumbent Buddha, the figure's left hand almost surreally looming in the composition's lower right corner. Lo created an image that operates on two levels. It records information pertinent to a documentary archive, and it demonstrates uh, the possibilities of what kind of images a talented photographer with less uh, cumbersome cameras and a greater interest in less conventional framings can make. This kind of photographic practice may be related to, if not informed by, the work of amateur art photographers, who willingly framed recognizable subjects in ways that injected subtle distortions and a modernist interest in transforming scenic elements into abstract shapes. The Law Archive transcends uh, minimal standards of documentary and expeditionary photography and offers images of unusual aesthetic value that cross into the realm of artistry. Amid its thousands of photographs, uh, one sees uh, James Law, the archivist as artist, working out visual problems and, in some cases, creating highly poetic images. The overall quality of the photographs indicates that James Law, along with Lucy Law and Gu Ting Peng, his associates in this complex endeavor, approach the process of recording the veritable museum of the caves in ways that not only permitted informational clarity, but also fulfilled his unspoken sense of what might make successful pictures. Pictures that were both factual documents and lyrical statements. James Law brought uh, exceptional ingenuity and an insistent passion to the work of photographing the caves. After leaving Dunhuang in 1944, he made his first prints uh, for an exhibition sponsored by the National Dunhuang Art Research Institute held in Nanjing, and then in Shanghai in 1948. In the late 1940s, the Laws moved to Taiwan, and only after they arrived in the United States in the early 1960s did James Law have the opportunity to make more prints. 
An archive of photographs offers constellations of visual facts and hints of facts and, as documents, the photographs become understandable to varying degrees only in relation to other frames of knowledge, whether, as with the law archive, Buddhist history and belief, or the history of Chinese painting. Several of the most evocative pictures in the law archive, however, point towards something intangible or uncontainable that is not simply about the specific subject matter represented and framed by the photograph. Good photographs tend to do this. The seemingly most straightforward and informational pictures in the law archive possess clarity and shrewd compositional structure, but they still show only portions of caves, portions of murals and portions of sculptural ensembles. The publication of the entire archive provides at least one means of seeing the photographs more easily as visual mosaics, however selective and incomplete despite their huge number. As such, the law archive becomes additionally compelling as a resource for cultural historians of religion, architecture and art history, as well as for the conservators now charged with protecting the site. In addition, scholars of Chinese photography may at least begin to appreciate one of the more exceptional early archives of Chinese documentary photographs informed by a distinctive vision. The archive opens a gateway into a pivotal moment in the history of the site itself and enables a glimpse of the world known to those who were fortunate enough to experience it. The viewer of the archive's black and white photographs can step back into a world when the Mogao and Yulin case were virtually open to anyone who might set foot there, to wander from one cave to another, marveling at all there was to be seen. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for joining me today and see you in the next video. Bye.